This is episode 39. I want to welcome new and returning viewers. Thank you so much for taking some time to tune in and invest um, in the content of the program. I also want to say thank you because I always do at the beginning of the show. Uh, and also because I haven't found any other way, any other words to really just describe um, how much your connections mean to me via social media. But thank you so much. Thank you for reaching out commenting and sharing um, your thoughts. Very much appreciated. Last time we chatted, I wasn't able to bring up the internet, and there were some introductions that I wanted to highlight um, from the introductions thread. We have a really vast group of experience and interest and knowledge, and I like to just highlight that because because there's resources everywhere. So um, first I have just Annie. She raises sheep and goats, Angor goats, including, um, and her sheep breeds is Icelandic, Wensleydale, and Coriadale. I have Pearl the Pacific. She has her own podcast, which I watch. You can find that on YouTube. She is originally from Hawaii, but living in Chicago now. So makes good sense why you'd want lots of wool. Um, she's also a designer and her designs are on Ravelry. I have BR4NKA. She's from Sweden and a new spinner. She has aspirations of getting to Gotland. And in conversation with her father, he mentioned that um, their ancestry in Croatia, there is an island off the coast of Croatia where um, there is a sheep breed. And I'm going to say it as it's spelled, um, PAG, P-A-G. Um, and I was like, I totally perked up my sheep breed ears, so I'm curious to learn more. And if you have any more to share about that sheep breed, please feel free to do so in the thread. I have Sally Rawlings, who lives in Australia now and had, uh, had lived in Alaska for 13 years. And I thought, well, that's such an interesting jump. Um, even though they're both on the Pacific side, I, I was just like, wow, Australia to Alaska. She's a spinner and a knitter, and she enjoys, enjoys breed-specific and natural-colored wools. Um, so funny, I have I watch podcasts, and um, everybody out there is like, all these gorgeous, beautiful colored yarns and um, sparkly and colorway names, and, and I was kind of reflecting on mine, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, every almost every single skein that I hold up is typically natural colored. <laughs> and then I was worried about the lighting today, being outside, because I'm kind of backlit. And then I was like, I don't have to worry about that. Because everything is going to be some variation of an earth tone and brown, gray, black. So, um, so I was like, one less thing for me to have, have to manage for the podcast. Um, then I have Lachman Kamama. Uh, she's from Germany. She used to raise sheep and dairy goats. And there is a really adorable picture of her feeding caddy lambs uh, in the thread. Um, she loves islands. And I definitely do, too. I strong attraction for very similar reasons that she highlights in her in, the, in her post um, and she plans to get sheep again soon so good luck to you and I if you do make sure to keep us informed on um, it with pictures so um, so thank you so much for introducing yourself and people who join the group people who have joined the group members if you want to introduce yourself I would encourage you to do so I just feel like it really highlights um, the depth that we've got going in this group for, um, like I said before, resources and accessing information and learning uh, new stuff from each other. So today I have work, uh, work, works in progress. I have a couple finished um, projects. I have one finished, well, I have two finished projects that are kind of combined into one. I'm gonna chat a little bit about spinning. I have a giveaway. And I have a Textiles and Time Knit Along introduction, which I'm calling the Shackleton Along. And I'll tell you more about that when we get to that portion of the program. But let's start with um, finished objects. Some of you know what this is going to be. Yay! I finished the hap. Here it is. Um... So the other finished object is I finished spinning all of the Hog Island, the additional four ounces, and I got 305 yards of that. And this is kind of a combined 
experience of spinning and knitting. Let's see if I can get that to focus at all. No. Uh, it's brown, <laughs> in case you're listening. It's a two-ply fingering weight yarn, um, and it's a it's a chocolatey brown. So finish that so I could finish the hap. I knit this for the hap along with Knit British. I missed the deadline. It is um, a compilation of breed specific yarns that all are um, part of the Livestock Conservancy. So we have Hog Island, Santa Cruz, Navajo Churro, Gulf Coast Native, and the American Jacob. It does include all of the feral wool breeds and they are all considered critical, which is the highest alert you can have, and then two threatened breeds, which is next up from critical, and that is the Navajo Churro and the American Jacob. I wanted to tell you um, a little bit about the American Livestock Con Conservancy, and if I can find my show notes. First of all, I went and looked, was doing some research, and I, they've, I have found out they've just launched a, a podcast um, on the Heritage Breed podcast. I haven't had a chance to listen to it, but I did want to bring your attention to it. I'm going to put that into my um, subscription list. But I also, you know, I don't think I ever really, I mean, I think I talked about Heritage Breeds, but I don't think I ever really defined Heritage Breeds. So I wanted to give you a sense of what that is in the United States. And I'm going to take it right from the site just so I don't have to um, rewrite or mess up any interpretation. So heritage breeds are traditional livestock breeds that were raised by our forefathers. These are the breeds of a bygone era before industrial agriculture became a mainstream practice. These breeds were carefully selected and bred over time to develop traits that made them well adapted to the local environment and they thrived under farming practices and cultural conditions that are very different from those found in modern agriculture. Traditional historic breeds retain essential attributes for survival and self-sufficiency, fertility, forage, foraging ability, longevity, maternal instincts, ability to mate naturally, and resistance to diseases and parasites. Heritage animals once roamed the pastures of America's pastoral landscape, landscape, but today these breeds are in danger of extinction. Modern ag has changed, causing many of these breeds to fall out of favor. Heritage breeds store a wealth of genetic resource that are important for our future and the future of our agricultural food system. Uh, so I had a, I remembered a question that had kind of come up in conversation somewhere, I can't remember where, about heritage breeds and the value. And so I wanted to just kind of bring that definition in um, as to why heritage breeds and conservation of these breeds demands attention or should have create we should have awareness about it um, and that has to do with the things that they highlighted in their definition which is um, genetic resource so these are animals that have established um, parasite resistance great foragers etc and so um, so that's kind of the gene pool it's kind of like a seed bank um, for our our, you know, our um, husbandry of animals. So anyway, I just wanted to, to bring that up just so people kind of understood, well, what does that mean to be a heritage breed and why should it, why is it important? I don't have on here, however, how they qualify critical, threatened, endangered, and recovering, and I might cover that next week. But um, anyway, just to give you a, a little tidbit there of information about heritage breeds. So, like I said, everything that I worked with in this shawl um, qualifies as a heritage breed in the United States. There are other heritage breeds that I did not include um, that you can take a look at. So, anyway, I would also, I don't know if the camera's going to pick it up, but you can, I don't know if you can see a difference, but there's, this is the Gulf Coast Native and that's the American Jacob. Um, I also wanted to mention this was kind of a community driven experience because the pattern was gifted to me by um, Goldie, Goldie Bear? I think so. 
Um, and I wanted to call her Han Goldie Hansel, but that wasn't right. So um, this is the Half Hansel by Gudrun Johnston. I knit it on a size 8, 5 millimeter. The pattern was gifted to me by Goldie Bear. And the Navajo Churro was gifted to me by Nitty Girl One or Heidi of Undead Yarns, and I spun that. The American Jacob was gifted to me, and that was hand prepped, um, hand spun from a fleece purchased um, by Emily of Fiber Town. The Santa Cruz was hand prepped, um, raw fleece by me, spun, and the Gulf Coast Native I received from as roving from a farm in Georgia. And the Hog Island I bought at my first Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival from the Finger Lakes Woolen Mill. I think I may have surprised the man a little bit when I ran into that booth. That was the first booth I went to at Maryland Sheep and Wool on my map. I was like, I'm going there, I'm buying Hog Island. And uh, and I was like, what if they're sold out? And I was the only person in the booth <laughs> when I got there. So no danger of that. Anyway, it hasn't been blocked, but the ends all but two are woven in. So. Hooray! That has left me in a little bit of like a what do I what am I gonna do now moment. So I'll tell you a little bit about that when we um, for spinning. So half Hansel, knit British, half along, heritage breed podcast, Goodred Johnson. I think I covered all my bases there. Next on the needles, I'm working on the Angostura by Ilsolde Teague. This is the front. I finished the back. I'm knitting it on a size eight US. Five millimeter. This is 13 mile farm yarn. It's predator friendly. And we've talked about that before on previous podcasts. This is in the, I know, I know this is a color. This is in a, the dusky plum colorway. So it's kind of like a twilight sky purple color. And there are traveling stitches um, that appear on the front on either side of the bus line. So I don't know if you can see those here or not. So I put my head right there. I think I will. Let me scoot so that you're not getting that. There. I'm going to sit on the edge of my seat. So that might work better for us. Can you see them? The um, stitch markers are were custom made for me. I don't know if I've shown these recently. Ooh, that one's coming. Um, by Scary to Mary. This is Belle and Co. And then I've got Smokey and Fern. So Scary to Mary, I sent her a picture and she custom made those for me. So the Angostura is going to be a vest. So once I'm done knitting um, the front, it'll be done and I mentioned last on the last podcast the beauty of this pattern is it's finishing on the armholes and the neckline because it's done in a reverse stockinette garter um, I cord bind off so that's all that's on the needles uh, for spinning I am going to spin this gradient of Shetland yarn and I got this from Contented Butterfly at New Hampshire Sheep and Wool, and they are located in Vermont. So as I figure out what colors are which, I will let you know. But that's up next. These are one ounce um, bits of roving. So I'm feeling like this is one of my most favorite colors. It's a beautiful, like, oh, that's thunder. It's a beautiful oatmeal y. Um, came and went color. I was a little distracted by the thunder. I'm wondering if I can make it. Did you hear the thunder? Yeah, did you hear Mr. Mr. Poopy? Mom! <laughs> well, we'll see if I have to head inside. Um, mom's, taking, mom's taking the dogs for a walk. It has a tendency always to add some bit of flair to the podcast. I did swear. I said flair. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about the knit along. You may or may not have heard that commentary. I'm going to talk about the knit along. Okay. As you can see, I moved inside because we had a thunderstorm move through. Although I'm looking out there right now and it's blue sky, but I figured I just push through. 
I think I left off, I had to do some major heavy editing of this one, but I think I left off with what, I, what I'll be spinning. And I'm going to do the, uh, the giveaway for Sarah's yarn now. So we had done a um, giveaway or a giveaway thread. And a lot of people um, <clears throat> made a point to do a donation to a, ch a pet charity or foster animals or some sort of gesture within that humane society community, a rescue community. And so that was um, one of the asks. I didn't necessarily require it to participate in the giveaway. So it was so great to see people take time to go do that. So I'm going to do the draw, I'm going to get to the group, and I'm going to do the random number generator, and I have everything right here, unsure of where the editing left off and what you may know and what you may not know. So let's do it. So it's going to be 2 through 21, I believe, but let me double check. I wrote it down in my notes. Yep, two through 21. And the number is 18. And that is Bluebird Nest. So Bluebird Nest, you have won two skeins of the Three Ply Coopworth and Ferns Watch giveaway. And she says, hi, Sarah, thank you so much for the podcast. Um, I'm not much for pets, but I do love the birds and bugs around here. A few days ago, two mating great spangled fritillary butterflies ended up stranded and still mating in our pond. My husband and I saved them or saned them out so they could complete their action. We need more butterflies in the world. So I love that there's a little bit of a, um, you know, it can be anything in any, you know, any way of taking time out of your day. I know that for me, I often... Try to keep an eye out for birds along the road, songbirds along the road, or um, even butterflies and dragonflies. So well done for highlighting that and uh, taking the time to save some butterflies. So Bluebird Nest, if you could get in touch with me, I will send those two skeins of Upton Yarns along to you. And again, thank you so much to everyone who, like I said, um, made a gesture for the welfare of our animals. I just shut this off and I didn't want to. Okay, now I'm redoing the knit along description because it got a little bit crazy and convoluted. <laughs> and so I, a while back, had been in touch with Jo uh, Shiny Bees podcast. She is in Scotland. And I had been talking about this pattern. And some of you are going to know where I'm going with this. <laughs> this is a Kate Davies pattern, Frost at Midnight. It is knit in lace weight yarn with a beaded yoke. And I was feeling particularly overwhelmed by the the thought, even the thought of knitting a sweater and lace weight yarn. So as we were writing back and forth, I came up with the idea to do a Shackleton along. Um, and what that really means, and I'll give you some backstory here, is Shackleton was a polar explorer, um, the South Pole, and he had an epic adventure um, traveling to the South Pole. And his boat was called the Endurance. There's a PBS um, Nova special about this particular adventure. Um, some of you may have heard of him, but I am kind of a polar exploration fiend, as is my husband. Our first date was at the Arctic Perry Museum in Bowdoin, uh, in Brunswick at the college, Bowdoin College. And so Shackleton kind of does what no other Arctic explorer does, is he has this journey that goes awry, but he brings back all his men alive. I don't typically read or watch these things, I mean, uh, watch these shows because the dogs always die and I don't like to, to go there, but nonetheless, these stories are amazing. And I was thinking about 
projects of epic proportions and I thought Shackleton Along would be a great way for participants to pick a challenge, all come together aboard the Endurance and know that we're going to make it out alive. Um, that being said, I'm going to read to you the ad that Shackleton placed, although there is conjecture that this doesn't actually exist or didn't happen. And I read that in the Smithsonian article, but I didn't really want to not include it because it's so great. Um, so for the Shackleton Along, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. So I invite you. We will be kind of starting this conversation on August 8th. That's when the thread will open. That's the day that Shackleton left from Plymouth, England in 1914, I believe, um, for Buenos Aires and eventually to South Georgia Island. Now, Joe and I have had very little time to talk about this, but we know we want to collaborate. So there's some secret squirrel plotting and there are not a lot of details. Just like that ad that Shackleton supposedly put out there for his participants, we are just throwing out the possibility and the potential. Everything else will fall into place as we, as we head into this together. Uh, so stay tuned for more on potential prizes. The, there's no real rules. Um, being a member of either group would be fantastic. Um, the only thing is to, the epic, the concept of epic will be relative to the person doing the project. So that might be spinning all of your own yarn for a sweater. For somebody else, it might be buying a fleece, preparing a fleece, and spinning all of the fleece. Um, for somebody else, it might be knitting their first sweater, knitting a lace weight sweater, um, spinning lace weight yarn, knitting a Shetland cobweb lace shawl, etc. So, um, so I recognize that Epic will have a different meaning for everybody, but this is just really a space and a forum to kind of launch into a big concept of a challenge. Um, steaking, you know, knitting a full Fair Isle vest and, and steaking, etc. So kind of catch my drift on Epic. But let me tell you a little bit about Shackleton. So his boat was the Endurance. He had been to the South Pole before on another couple other expeditions. Um, and there's a lot of rivalry around traveling in the Antarctic um, and who got there first and et cetera, et cetera. But we're more concerned with just his particular experience, which was supposedly going to be a transcontinental party. As I said, he sailed from Ply Plymouth um, on August 8th, right, right when World War I broke out. He arrived in Buenos Aires and he departed for South Georgia on October 26th. By January 19th of 1915, he was solidly frozen into sea ice. Um, they were locked in that ice for 281 days aboard the Endurance. And from what I can gather, they abandoned the Endurance on October 27th and they set up winter camp on the ice near the boat, next to the boat. There's descriptions of the men playing football on the ice, that there's like a lightness to this camp. And uh, I believe that that whole uh, morale kind of deflates by a, a November 21st when the endurance actually sinks in the ice. It's crushed and it sinks below the ice. So they abandoned the boat and started an overhaul journey, um, overland journey, I'm sorry, hauling their lifeboats. By this time, the boat had drifted 1,186 miles from the original space where they were frozen in, and they were 346 miles from Paulette Island, where Shackleton knew there was a provisioned hut. The hut, the hut had been built in 1902 by a Swedish explorer, and it had been stocked by an Argentinian supply ship, and the Shackleton knew this because he had commissioned those supplies for the Argentinian government. I don't think they were connected to his particular expedition, but he knew of this, um, for these, of these provisions. So that was his goal. Um, the sea ice disintegrated as the men made their way um, across the, as they were hauling the boats by, by, by man. Um, so they, were, they got into the lifeboats and traveled 720 nautical miles in open air life, lifeboats um, back to South Georgia. 
that's a really condensed version. Um, there was a series of stops and months on this island and months on this island, and some men were left here, and people went on, and then they were, came back and rescued the men um, after many attempts to rescue them. They talk about the orcas coming up through the sea ice, the thin ice, and grabbing seals and creating these massive craters. And they, can, they talk about being on their dog sleds, hauling across the, the thin ice and orcas breaking through and trying to follow them and they could hear the sounds um, the, of their uh, blowholes and their breathing and um, it's really a great gripping story. I don't think I'm doing it justice because I'm giving you such a shallow version but um, but yeah it, I found a website I think it was polarexploration.org, but I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and it gives like day by day of his journal and what he had to say. And, um, and then these descriptions of what happened on the ice. So anyway, I hope you'll join us for the Shackleton along. I will be doing the Kate Davies yokes frosted midnight pattern and hopefully purchasing my yarn for that in the next couple of days. Um, I will open the thread August 8th. You can start some conjecture about what your endurance project will be, your Shackleton project will be, and we will um, we will embark together on um, th this epic project. So, all right, knit along. Oh, let me tell you about some acquisitions and the retreat. So, I ran a retreat with Maine Yarn and Fiber Supply. It was a four-day retreat, I think. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, so they arrived Saturday night, left Wednesday morning. And we had vendors, we rented a beautiful home, and there'll be some video at the end of this podcast of the house where we were. Um, we were in Machias Port, which is real true down east, me, north of Bar Harbor, and looking out, right off out the Atlantic, directly over towards um, open water. So that was a real... Um, powerful landscape to be sitting and knitting on. We had spinners and knitters. We did a visit to Starcroft uh, Fiber Mill and people were able to buy Nash Island fleeces. Um, I did get a Nash Island fleece and it is still at the mill. <laughs> and, um, and we fed everybody. So all the meals um, Jody and I made, Jody of Maine Yarn and Fiber Supply and myself Fiber Truck, we did all the meals, all the food, and um, yeah, it was a really spectacular event. We had great vendors. Um, aside from the fact that it wasn't sunny, but that doesn't mean it was a that doesn't that's not a negative thing. It was misty and foggy, and it was cool, so a lot of people could wear their woolens and um, and enjoy the ocean air. Uh, and I think people were really um, happy to not be hot and sticky, <laughs> for that matter. So yeah. It was a really laid back experience. They did some solar dyeing. I'll show you some pictures of that. Some salt water solar dyeing, well, mist dyeing. And we had chats and talks about wool and preparing wool and you know, different types of wool. And of course the visit to Starcroft. So it was a really spectacular experience. Um, I got brought a special gift. I don't know where just a little gray, who was one of our attendees, found these. But it is August and I'm eating Cadbury eggs. So I'm very excited. So thank you so much, Just a Little Gray. Um, I did do a bit of shopping. Um, I got some Rambouillet from Downey's Fiber Farm. This is her own Rambouillet. It is brown. I think I got four ounces. Um, it's kind of a light beigey brown with white flecks um, from her own sheep. And it's such a, has such a different feel than the Hog Island or, um, oh God, dog hair. Even the, um, even the Gulf Coast Native that I spun has a, a little bit of a different feel. I also got from Rachel of On The Round. She sells these adorable bags by Matterroot. So I got one of these. Um, she has a new line that includes a sheep on them and I wanna get one of those. But anyway, I picked that up. 
And as a gift, um, as a birthday gift, I received from my friend Jody of One Lupin this piece of jewelry by Heather Perry, who is um, all of Nightshade on Instagram, where she does post her work. And this particular piece was done using um, Jody's hand spun of a linen border luster cross and Coopworth locks from Hatchtown Farm. And that's where this um, texture was created. Uh, this is called the Shield, uh, Shepherdess Shield. There are still a few available through One Lupa, and you can contact Jody. They have a small version, which is kind of like this big, and then they have this size um, version. So anyway, I had to get one of these. Um, and Jody surprised me, and it was a really touching and meaningful gift. So I would encourage you to take a look at Heather's work, and she has another line very similar to this, but she uses antique lace and presses that textile into the into the silver. So that was the acquisition. So I got my last acquisition. I had to stop and bring it up, and but. I was sent a pattern by Whiskey Bay Woolens. It's already going in the right direction because it's Whiskey Bay. Um, these are her Squeaky Beach mitts. And um, I love them. She describes them as rugged lace. And they're kind of in a grayish yarn. And I was like, it all comes together. Whiskey, gray, rugged lace. So... Like I said, I think, I'm thinking I've got some North Ronaldsy, which I think will be perfect for these. And of course it's gray. Um, it's not located here. It's at my home and I'll probably hopefully cast those on in the fall. So I just wanted to give you that resource because these are a great way to start lace. Um, if you are preparing for your endurance and lace is going to be your, um, Shackleton so, challenge. Anyway, uh, I am going to say farewell and go back to knitting. Actually, I'm going to take my dog for a walk. I'm going to go for a walk, dodge some thunderstorms, and then I'm going to contemplate what is going to be next on the needles. So I'll enjoy my evening doing that. All right, take care. Bye.